Hello again, and welcome back to uh, the second episode of this Post Concussion Syndrome Awareness podcast. Um, in, the, in the first introductory episode, um, I gave you a little bit of background about myself and the, the groups that um, myself and my colleagues have uh, been running on Facebook for the last 10 years. And uh, now we're going to take a little look inside post concussion syndrome itself. And uh, that's probably going to you know, maybe take a few episodes, um, but starting with a little bit about the history. And so uh, this is from an article which I'd written a, a few years ago, um, information about uh, the actual history um, and how post-concussion syndrome became, uh, by its modern name, to be, to be called as such. Um, for many hundreds of years, the effects of what was called then mild head injury, uh, what we now know as PCS, were completely misunderstood. It was treated widely as a type of madness in uh, uh, sanitariums, uh, asylums, and special hospitals, um, and e even lunatic asylums. Uh, until the 19th century, uh, significant changes in general attitudes to mild head injury occurred. This was due to uh, mainly the beginning of the industrial age and significant scientific process and um, society uh, at that particular time. Uh, the uh, inception of railways and advancements in the study and medical research of neurology had brought many revelations, some of which would cast new light on the age-old problem. Uh, it was in 1866 that a Danish-born surgeon called John Eric Erikson, who was working in London, he published an important paper on the effects of mild head injury symptoms, um, and these were widespread among generally railway workers, uh, most of all. Until this time, he had lent his own name to the condition, uh, Erickson's disease, which he described as a molecular disarrangement to the spine. This was a point where modern litigation uh, actually began to rear its ugly head for the first time in relation to health matters and disputes between individuals. And many legal defendants saw evidence to deny the reality and existence of a particular condition. Uh, which was rail railway spine or railroad spine, uh, as it's known in America. So Erickson boldly proposed that the condition was a real phenomenon, often affecting manual workers whose task was that of laying and constructing of uh, railway tracks. It was very hard and demanding physical labour uh, before they had machines. He theorised that repeated shocks from hammer or sledgehammer blows uh, were causing repetitive jarring of both the spines uh, spinal column, neck and brain of these workers and over a period of time um, the problem and its effects could uh, you know get worse and worse uh, but sometimes just with only only one uh, heavy impact uh, of a hammer or a sledgehammer blow. The same effects could also be found in passengers who'd been in railway shunts and accidents um, and he, he kind of observed them to be similar to those of whiplash Hence, legal arguments in court cases produced counterclaims from defence lawyers. Uh, what was known as railroad spine or railway spine was actually a figment of the imagination of these claimants uh, so they could get hold of the money. Erickson went on to gain favour uh, as Queen Victoria's personal surgeon and was made a baronet and member of the Royal Fellow of Surgeons whilst he was living and working in London. Uh, the unfortunate premise of counterclaims against the reality of rail, railway spine as a valid condition has uh, stuck to this day, thanks to the growth of legal litigation throughout the 20, following 19th, 20th century and into the present day. Um, during the early years of the 20th century, uh, it was more commonly known, or the condition became known, as part of... Uh, shell shock or it was an element of shell shock which also maybe is also something to do with combat stress reaction what we now know as PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder and it was very very common throughout both great wars it was found that even soldiers without any visible head or physical injuries were suffering very similar symptoms and those that suffered actual brain injuries on the battlefield because of the strong elements of psychological mental disturbances that came from shell shock, there was uh, 
plenty of adversity surrounding these soldiers, the poor unfortunate soldiers who suffered in World War I. Uh, this was in the age before modern psychiatry, allopathic drugs, psychology and uh, knowledge of post-traumatic stress was, was very great. Therefore, many of the soldiers were persecuted and a lot of them were actually prosecuted as well by their own commanders and superiors, uh, then labelled as traitors and cowards. Um, military records from the time show that several thousand soldiers were put on trial during this period, court-martialed for so-called cowardice. And a few hundred of those unlucky souls were also executed um, as, under court-martial as a result. The misunderstanding is further deepened the divide then between like, benevolent medical science and the suspicious disbelief of the legal profession, profession uh, which continues more or less to this day. Uh, yeah, to test the theory, yeah, look, have a look, have a look, quick Google look for, um, you know, Google search or whatever browser you use for um, uh, injury, head injury. Uh, lawyers no win no fee and, and I'm sure you could probably sit and scroll through that for days on end and, and still not get to the end of it. Then on to the Second World War, next stage of this uh, historical journey, uh, the term shell shock was banned by the British military authorities in order to avoid hysteria uh, regarding an epidemic or you know to, they didn't want people to know. And yet problems continued again as a direct result of ground troops in open combat. However, as another generation of brave young men made the uh, ultimate sacrifice to their countries, there was more of a, a move towards the beginnings of modern psychiatry. Then the term post-trauma concussion state was coined in 1939 by military doctors to replace the term of shell shock and to describe what we now call post-concussion syndrome. Still, many of the veterans of the war suffer these horrific mental scars from horrors of battle and further wars around the world, uh, most significantly in Korea, Vietnam, and the, the, the Gulf War in Iraq, and, and now uh, everywhere, kind of through the Middle East almost. Uh, and who knows? I mean, this epidemic must be just becoming of ginormous proportions in this modern day and age. Um, as a result of battle-related post-concussion syndrome, many military studies on neuropsychology have been undertaken and they greatly contribute invaluable data and statistics uh, which could be used in the future to help develop further treatments for PCS. Um, my own grandfather was uh, a victim of shell shock during his uh, war service, uh, I think through both wars and then in the Second World War. He was thrown off his motorcycle, uh, you know, and he's never the same again at all. All his family testified to that. Uh, in the current day situation, uh, yeah, our perceptions of the condition as an invisible illness or disability, hidden disability, uh, it's still what is seen as very complex. And in the media and the main, to the layman, a laywoman, it was a very misunderstood subject. Uh, especially when they can't see anything wrong with you, they can't kind of like there's no scar, you know, big scars in your head. You're not you're not kind of a plate in your head or a hair missing or anything like that. Um, it, it becomes very difficult to express, uh, particularly to the person who's suffering uh, PCS. Uh, they they they're probably in the, the toughest position. Today, uh, we seem to be in the early days of an important transition. Um, the old attitudes and the old conflicts over the status, whether it being real or not, or being contested and challenged, it is starting to um, you know, dissolve a lot as well. And in the USA particularly, uh, where the problem and the epidemic has surfaced in the public mind due to uh, NFL, baseball, hockey, soccer and other other types of um, uh, concussion uh, stories that have come up from not just school kids and, and high school kids but to professionals as well uh, and then you've also got a CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy which is a whole other different horror in terms of neurology and so this has been uh, the mantle's been taken by uh, the American healthcare system, uh, although, as, as any of you that live in America and Canada know, that uh, 
it's a lot tougher, especially if you've very little money or, or you, you don't have uh, any, anyone to, to kind of pay for your treatment. Uh, it, it can literally ruin you. Um, and so if you have good insurance, if you have a, a reasonably good uh, income and lifestyle, then you may be able to kind of get to the bottom of it a lot easier. Uh, whereas other countries such as uh, my beloved England, Britain, we do have a national health system and it, uh, it doesn't really want to tackle post-concussion syndrome at all. And I first figured that out back in 2006. And I think uh, I, I tried to get, I live in what is reasonably, probably one of the poorer cities in England, uh, probably among, among the five, four, four or five poorest cities in England, um, which is Bradford. And here, uh, you just can't get treated for love nor money. And uh, I think I, I was asking them, even after three or four uh, MTBI, after four concussions, I was asking them for like six, seven, eight years, please, please, will you let me see a neurologist? Can you please refer me? And every time there was a different excuse, oh no, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, you're just depressed, or, uh, you know, or, or it's something from your childhood, or, or you've got, trying to, you know, spring misdiagnosis on me and things. And I think this is very common um, in most areas in Britain, which is shocking, really, because although we don't generally have private health insurance here, we have a public system, the NHS, um, we've already paid for it through our taxes, VAT, all the other taxes and hidden taxes that, you know, you pay your whole working life. Uh, a person may have paid, you know, for 20, 30 years into the system, and, you know, I'm talking a lot of money as well. And then at the point of use, the system is meant to be free, but then you're denied access to it. So think about that in America, if you would. <laughs> this is, um, you know, quite quite a scary point to think about. Imagine you, you'd, you'd paid your health insurance uh, for like 10, 20, 30 years, all the premiums and stuff, and then uh, gone to kind of claim help, and which I'm sure does happen. And when you can't try to claim your help, then you've turned away with like, no, we don't believe you're sick, can't see anything wrong with you. Uh, we don't have any tests or any um, any kind of scanners like DTI or anything to detect what you've got. So it's literally a case of, you know, they, they, they treat it like, well, you know, a tree's fallen in a forest or something. You know, nobody heard it, so uh, it doesn't exist. But anyway, back to the history of post-concussion syndrome. So um, we've seen in the modern age uh, with a lot of... Uh, chronic conditions, things that have come to light through the media uh, seem to be the ones that are recognised and taken forwards. And even here in, in Britain in 2014, I think it was, with the World Cup, there are incidents there which finally raised the subject in Britain for discussion. Now that has made its way into uh, football or soccer, whatever you want to call it, uh, when and other spots as well. If a player or two players collide, the heads collide uh, during the game, or they knock heads or whatever, or one goes down, doesn't matter, um, the game must be immediately stopped and uh, a doctor, a physio must come on the field just to, to check that that player is suited to carry on. Um, unfortunately, it, it does sometimes um, fall short uh, because players have continued and still gone on to suffer problems with post-concussion syndrome and be totally unaware that they're suffering this condition. Um, I think the majority of cases are in men, uh, although this isn't generally reflected on social media. But through football and soccer here, um, it, it's still quite a taboo subject. Um, we don't have as many contact spots as America or Canada that are full on, but we do have rugby, which is, uh, well, I don't know, it's kind of like NFL without any helmets or pads, so may maybe I should take that back. Um, so the history side, the history lesson is now in a, another stage where we've got almost a new paradigm coming in care, health care, uh, which is actually stalling and stagnating because of 
uh, the stranglehold that the uh, MHRA, that's the, like the uh, equivalent of the FDA or the Health Association, has in America. This MHRA, uh, which controls the NHS and all the health and, and laws of health and treatment in the United Kingdom and Britain. Uh, and what we know is that the governing body, the, the board uh, of this MHRA, all the uh, members are on the uh, board to the pharmaceutical companies like GlaxoSmithKline and uh, Pfizer and all these others. So you've got a regulatory authority making decisions on what's best for people's health and, and basically, well, in my opinion, acting like a, a corporate mafia uh, and just getting rid of anybody they don't want to uh, see. Um, such as Dr. David Noakes with GC Math recently, um, he was curing cancer patients and up to 50 different illnesses. Uh, he's put in prison and his, his partner, his lab assistant, put in prison uh, to be extradited to France, uh, uh, hearing this week actually. So this MHRA uh, made up of corporate heads of pharmaceutical companies um, doesn't recognise post-concussion syndrome, they're not really bothered about it. They know that they can make so much profit from painkillers and antidepressants and things like that, and and generally that that's probably quite a large slice of their uh, you know annual pie. Uh, I think the turnover worldwide is is round about a trillion dollars a year now. Profits probably in the region of about four hundred uh, million, uh, four hundred billion dollars a year. Sorry, and so. They've tried to look at drugs and things to develop for PCS, um, but they can't quite seem to find anything because, as we know from uh, Michael McCrea's work and Leddy and others, that um, uh, PCS doesn't respond. It doesn't respond beyond a very short term. Only the symptoms can be slightly improved between a month, two or three. But as I know personally, if you go on longer than that uh, and you're taking these types of drugs for... Uh, months or years, then you're going to get increasingly sick, but not necessarily just from the PCS, but from all the symptoms and side effects. And uh, you only need to take a look at the uh, care leaflets or the safety leaflets or whatever they're called for each drug. Um, you know, something like codeine or dihydrocodeine, you look and it says, uh, and the side effects and symptoms is like may cause more pain. Antidepressants may cause depression, low mood. Tranquilizers may cause anxiety. Um, so, yeah, this is a big part, and it's been a massive part, of how we've tried to guide people down the years, and it's met so much resistance in the past, and still does meet a lot today, especially in the discussion forums on Facebook, um, where there's a mixture of people um, certainly for mild traumatic brain injury and post-concussion syndrome and prolonged or persistent post-concussion syndrome, there is no mandate to take any kind of drugs regularly for more than a month or two or three in the initial stages in order to ease a transition uh, and to allow the brain's healing, uh, the neuronal healing, neuroplasticity to, to get underway uh, and, and be successful. Uh, I think that the people who have obviously been more unfortunate to suffer traumatic brain injury, uh, so that's moderate, and then a severe traumatic brain injury, have usually been hospitalised, whereas the majority with mild traumatic brain injury often haven't. Uh, in fact, a large percent don't even get to hospital, like myself. I've never been to hospital once, uh, because here they wouldn't know what to do with you anyway. And so, yeah, the, there's quite a big difference. The ones that have had the moderate TBI or STBI more severe are probably going to be ones that have either had surgery or they've been in comas or they've had you know, other sustained injuries to the neck, chest, body, and, uh, and you know, maybe to the skull, the brain, brain bleeds, uh, all kinds of things. So they're going to be on medication long term. Uh, more likely than not and that then is a whole different other type of rehabilitation um, you know but there is there is hope for everybody in other means and you know there's always a, a pathway which is relatively drug free and so the history the history's uh, still been written 
we know about that. Um, at this stage, new developments with sound and light and all kinds of things. We, we've got uh, methods and ways to rehabilitate, you know, uh, neuro biofeedback, neurofeedback, and to look at the actual condition as its a collection of 40 odd symptoms on a lot of different levels. You know, you've got to attack it um, spiritually, you've got to attack it physically, psychologically, emotionally, um, you know, with all kinds of means. And not just to rely on one or two things at a time, and then if that doesn't work, try one or two other things. I think you need a, a definite program, a lifestyle change, diet, exercise, what you put into your mind, what you believe, if you want to study self-hypnosis, to use binaural beats, to use biofeedback, uh, to use supplements, to use you know what's classed as food supplements, can actually be very powerful medicines. Things such as flavonoids, which are anti-inflammatory, can help with the repair of the brain and brain cells. And then you've got EPA, DHA, and fish oils and other oils which can cross the blood-brain barrier. And then, of course, there's, there's GC Math, which can, uh, if, well, if you can find the right person to do it, somebody that's not been locked up, that is, uh, is uh, a natural protein from the human body. So it's something you've already got in your body. Uh, you've got about a billionth of a gram of it, and it's there to uh, activate macrophages, which are the cells which fight disease off and cancers and, uh, and bad cells in the body. So if you can get somebody that works with that, uh, I think there's Dr. Antonio Ruggiero, you'll find him on YouTube, um, and he's, he's one of the pioneers, and there's also, um, uh, I think, different glycoproteins and things that he talks about. Then you can use those to help aid uh, the healing of uh, your brain. Uh, so unfortunately, so many people get stuck in the system, and they don't actually realize that they have a lot of different choices. Uh, and you might think, well, how, how do you know about these? Well, my background has been in uh, healing and, and natural medicine and things like that. That's what I study, you know. I've been a massive geek for this for, for many years. And I've just kept looking and looking and searching and searching and, and never really stopping. Always have your eyes open, always be on the lookout for something and check every bit of information twice, three times. Find out who's used it, what did they think, what did they feel, how did it work, and go from there. You know, as soon as you kind of sit tight and say, well, why, well, you know, the doctors say no, you know, and the guy in his white coat knows, uh, you know, he, he talks very well and, you know, he's got this, this treatment and that treatment and so on. Well, yeah, okay, respect to the doctors and the nurses and the specialists uh, in the healthcare profession. I don't have any, any grievance with them whatsoever, but all I would say is they're not seeing the whole picture. Their governing body, such as the MHRA in Britain or uh, whoever it is in America, um, they're only teaching them from textbooks which are written by the pharmaceutical industry, the ghost written. So it's not that they're bad people, or, you know, they're consciously doing this thinking, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to offer one or two things and they keep this person ill. No, no, none of that. They just simply do not know what's beyond the arena of kind of modern allopathic healthcare. Uh, and that is why, like I said before, we, we, need, we need this new paradigm to hurry up. A paradigm shift, in fact. You could shift from being... Um, kind of quite sick through hidden illness to being well within weeks and months. Now, in my last podcast, episode one, I uh, I was talking about uh, all, all manner of different things, uh, but I talked about how I learned to recover from concussion and in simple and natural ways very, very quickly. Um, it is sometimes uh, a bit of an intuitive art. So if, if you work with healing or any healing modality or therapy, you're going to know that you have to use your intuition. Uh, but there are certain things, which I will get into later, that uh, are very natural and free and easily available. Um, 
that can help you, that can help your brain give it a massive boost in those early hours and days when you've been concussed. Um, obviously, the main things to do is, is to, you know, take it easy. Uh, try not to sleep too much, particularly through the day. Hydration, really important. But then don't forget your flavonoids as well. Uh, and then things like uh, turmeric, which would be actually not turmeric, but the uh, active alkaloid, curcumin. Curcuminoids are highly anti-inflammatory. And the most recent version is Novosol curcumin that comes in an oil form with vitamin D in a capsule. Uh, so that's the type of thing you can take. Uh, maybe the fish oils, uh, omega-6, 3-9, high in EPA, DHA, uh, other flavonoids like Reversitrol, uh, MSM, which is uh, methyl sulfamethane, sulfur, uh, organic sulfur tablets, um, different things that are anti-inflammatory. And uh, in a homeopathic sense, you may want to look and find help of a homeopath, but always get professional advice um, and, you know, f find somebody who can g at least tell you what to buy, what to take and, and how much to take. And of course, always, always with everything, uh, read the care leaflets. Um, Arnica is one of the, the Arnica Montana remedies, one of the best, in my opinion, um, immediately after a concussion. Uh, whenever you feel that, that swelling in your head or when you, you kind of feel it, it tightening, then you know that there's something there from nature that can help to de-stress and, and reduce the bruising or the sense of that, that injury is, is, is causing you to be inflamed. There are many other remedies as well. I haven't got time to go into them all here and I'm not a qualified homeopath, so uh, maybe yeah, find good information on that as well. Um, other things, yeah, like uh, oils, essential oils, there are many which are good. Um, probably my favourite and a lot of people's favourite is uh, Copaiba. Copaiba or Copafera officinalis is a tree from in the Amazon uh, that's tapped for the oleo resin. The oleo resin is then steam distilled into a wonderful smelling oil. It's very, very high in beta carphalines. Uh, I think it's up around about 40% and other terpenes and these are chemicals which you'd normally find in cannabis oil, Simpson oil um, and some of them in CBD oil as well. So the concentrations of BCP, the beta carflanes in capybara oil are generally uh, twice the, that of cannabis oil or more than twice as much. So y you're talking about you know, less than a tenth of the price, but you've got this wonderful topical oil. Um, and, you know, what do you do with it? Well, th the main thing is, yeah, you had a concussion. So what's what's a, the soft, tender areas? What's the uh, the bruised areas? What's the areas that are, you're going to feel it in? Around your neck, the back of your neck, behind your ears, on your scalp, uh, maybe the top of your forehead. Don't go too near your eyes or your nose, uh, you know, because you might be sensitive to it. And as with any essential oil, try a tiny little bit. Um, obviously, capaiba is one that you can usually put straight in your skin without diluting in carrier oil. But if you want to put it in carrier oil, then, then you know, get some help to dilute it as well. Uh, but generally, it's, it's one of the few ones that is safe to go straight onto your skin and you can get going straight away with that. Um, so, yeah, think about massaging that into your scalp uh, around the affected area. It works wonders, uh, especially if, you, if you've cut or grazed yourself when you've had a concussion. And if there is any bruising on the skin or the surface, then the capiba heals bruises and, and cuts and grazes up like magic. Uh, I've literally tested this so many times uh, with a like, burnt myself on the other back of the hand, you know, red hot oven. Uh, I, I smeared capybara on once and then twice, like before bed. I'm woken up the next day and, and it's just completely started to heal over. No blistering, no no redness, no nothing. So um, there's many, many different alkaloids or what they call phytochemicals in that as well. So have a read up yourself. Capybara is spelled C-O-P-A-I-B-A. And, you know, there's other things you can do. You can uh, use sound as well in the early days. Uh, YouTube now is, is a wonderful resource for free uh, tools, healing tools. Um, 
and sometimes all you just need to put in is like healing for concussion, uh, healing sounds for concussion. Uh, rife frequencies, that's R-I-F-E. If you look for rife frequencies for concussion or brain injury, uh, those are electronical electronic signals, uh, frequency aimed at helping reduce inflammation and problems resulting from concussion. So there's, there's just a few things there uh, that you, you should really think about having a little little toolbox of different things, you know, because none of us can say we're never going to get concussed again. Uh, you know, we can't say we're never going to have that problem again. And, you know, you can go years. I did, I went years without having concussion and all of a sudden one day just one split second of carelessness and whack top of the head um, and you can really really uh, you know regress back if you let yourself you can regress back and you can end up then it, it, it takes over your emotions it takes over your, your psyche and you can end up being fearful or anxious so that's precisely the time when you want to make affirmations to yourself as well. Um, whether you use mantra, uh, meditation, or whether you just use affirmations in everyday life. Um, if you're being concussed or injured, one of, I believe that one of the most important things to aid you recover is firmly believing positively that you will recover quickly, that you recover fast, and that you're not going to have any problems Whenever I've instilled that belief into myself, um, that's a spiritual side of healing, I guess. Whenever I've instilled instilled that belief into myself after, after having a concussion, then I've always um, recovered a lot quicker, like within days or within a week. And it's just, you've got to say to your mind, I am going to recover. Because when you first have a concussion the first time, you don't know what's happening. You've no idea what's going on. You've no idea what to expect. It's like being a, a random stranger coming up and give you a, a ticket for like you know the, the the wildest roller coaster ride that you can possibly go on emotionally, and you like you don't know when you get on it and all of a sudden you you kind of cast here and there. I told you in the last episode a uh, little little bit about what happened to me, uh, you know, back in two thousand six to two thousand and nine and so on, and you know that was it was a crazy ride. Going through that, losing my home, losing my job, having things, you know, money taken from me, and you know, then being, you know, dealing with people uh, day to day, just trying to to get on with life. It can be really cruel, as as you know, anybody that's had post concussion syndrome will know anyway. Uh, for people who who haven't ever had. Uh, post-concussion syndrome or haven't suffered concussions if you are listening to this then you know I hope that that insight can give you some well a, a little bit of information um, it's always far far harder to to fully comprehend from the outside um, but by you know listening to people's accounts it, it, if you've got enough empathy <laughs> as I'm sure you have then that can be uh, a real way forward to, to kind of understanding because it, it could you know be a loved one of yours a family member or a friend that's suffering at the moment you know you've noticed in them personality changes that the, you know the temper uh, may be more you know quick to break than it used to be they may uh, have emotional ability so they may laugh and cry at things that are, are, you know really strange triggers uh, you, there may be all sorts of things that you notice about your, your, your loved one or your friend uh, that you can't understand. So all I would say to you is, yeah, if, if you do, if you are listening to gain some insight and knowledge on post-concussion syndrome and what it's like, then uh, it, it, it's it, it's a good thing that you're doing that, and that person will appreciate you making the effort and having the empathy and having the time to understand. So, okay, um, so that's about the history of post-concussion syndrome. Um, there's a couple of other things as well uh, that I wanted to just uh, tell you. That there's some information from the medical profession itself. Uh, a lot of it can be very technical and long-winded, um, but I'm just going to read you a couple of bits here from uh, conclusions uh, on one uh 
scientist's work on maltraumatic brain injury. And he says basically that, that the diagnosis of PCS is, is plagued by a lot of different factors. Uh, mostly it's the, like the poor reliability of diagnostic criteria. And then there's like the non-specificity of PCS symptoms. So it's like for, um, from a doctor's or neurologist's point of view, it's trying to pin things down because they can't find or they can't see often with the tools and the equipment that they've got where the exact problem is. Uh, and he also says that symptoms that make up the core criteria for the diagnosis uh, of PCS are also like highly non-specific to either mild traumatic brain injury or PCS, and that they're commonly reported in uh, things like psychiatric disorders, mental illness, and even pe healthy people. Uh, they suggest that estimates say that about 15 to 20 percent of uh, mild traumatic brain injury patients will have, will develop p persistent or prolonged post-concussion syndrome or, or disorder, um, you know, to an inflated extent. Uh, the true incidence of PCS is more likely a range of 1 to 5% of all the people who suffer mild traumatic brain injury or concussions. Um, contrary to conventional thought, the frequency uh, of structural injuries it's identifiable on the neuroimaging uh, after uh, MTBI may actually be considerably higher than the true incidence of persistent PCS. So yeah, th th there's uh, other uh, things that don't quite add up as well. And the combination of uh, psychological principles related to expectations and recovery and then he talks about iatrogenic factors. Iatrogenesis is when, you know, kind of the doctors get things wrong or they don't do what they should do or they don't know what to do and ends up harming the patient. And it says it's also a contribute to in individual, individual cases of persistent or prolonged PCS. So, yeah, we've got a, a top neurologist here admitting that a lot of the time doctors are, are causing the post-concussion syndrome to uh, be prolonged and, and go on a lot longer than it should do. It also says that existing treatment models are, are really nowhere quite near yet and the outcome can, if well, if it's done right, it says and enhanced in the right way, in a, in a varied enough way, then it can reduce uh, elements of disability relating to the injury. So yeah, there's a lot more information there. I won't go into it again because it is, it is quite um, uh, a technical read, that one, uh, Michael McCrea's book. But there's uh, always, yeah, there's always plenty of room for improvement, is what he's saying. Um, I know that there probably won't be many doctors or, sur or surgeons or neuro psychologists or anybody that, that listens to this podcast pod, podcast uh, probably not many from the NHS in England either or Britain either um, if they do they, they, they generally I don't know they I don't want to um, be confrontative over that but they, they generally tend to shy away from conversations uh, on maltraumatic brain injury and post concussion syndrome so if, if you are in that profession and you're listening to this privately then well there are a lot of resources around uh, Michael McCrea's Michael A. McCrea's book Mild Traumatic Brain Injury and Post Concussion Syndrome The New Evidence Base for Diagnosis and Treatment that's the Oxford Workshop Series that's been out for 10 years so that's you know there's also the Concussion Crisis uh, Diane Robert Stoller's book as well. There's quite a few books out there. Uh, the medical textbooks, obviously, the more expensive ones. Um, but yeah, there's quite a, f a lot of detailed information there. So if you are listening to this and thinking, well, you know, I'm not being told about this, I don't know what to do, but well, just do like I did, you know, go and find the books, read them, read them again, study it. Um, you know, contact the people, ask questions like I've done. Um, it, it's not something that is taboo or hidden completely in the scientific world. So, you know, if you're looking to enhance your own knowledge, uh, then definitely don't just wait for your 
superior or anybody else there uh, to tell you to do it. Just do it, do it yourself. It's better to have some knowledge. It's better to have an understanding rather than just to say, well, uh, no, you know, blanket, nobody knows about it. Um, we don't know enough. No, nobody does. Um, because that, that really can be harmful. It can be a very harmful attitude to take, in my opinion. And, um, you know, in, in terms of the Hippocratic Oath, uh, you know, do not do no harm first. So if, if you don't know <laughs> and you, you, you're not prepared to find out, then you could well be harming people. And I believe that's happened to myself down the years of being caused harm by doctors that just simply didn't want to know. And I'm sure it's happened to many hundreds, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of other patients with post-concussion syndrome throughout the world, unfortunately. Um, they, they've been victims of a system that, well, yeah, is not really that interested in them. Um, it's interested in, you know, kind of giving them whatever drugs they think will help the symptoms, but in, in terms of healing or a cure, the, there are ways to do that. And, um, you know, until you join up all the dots with other types of medicine, functional medicine, naturopathy, homeopathy, therapeutic medicine, um, any kind of holistic medicine altogether, uh, as well as allopathic medicine, because it does have its place. If you read books like The Quantum Doctor by Amit Goswami, he says exactly the same. You know, nobody's nobody's gang ganging up on modern healthcare, allopathic allopathic uh, pr practitioners and medicine. Nobody's ganging up on you. We're saying, well, actually, yeah, come in and be part of the new paradigm of healing. Uh, there's always a way forward, which includes everybody. You can't just say, oh, our way is the only way and everybody else is, is uh, you know, kind of like ineffective and, and useless. Uh, you know, all these things don't work or they're dangerous and so on. No, it needs to be everything together. So you can't have a true holistic way of healing without including everything. So uh, that would be good if you are listening to this and you are um, a part of the healthcare system then please, please maybe look up some of those books I suggested um, and obviously check out our website as well, which of course I will just give to you, which is um, postconcussionsyndromeawareness.uk.wordpress.com. I'm sorry, I, I got that wrong last time. I, I, I was going on the old .com site, but it is postconcussionsyndromeawareness at WordPress. You can find us on Twitter, tweet us, and you'll find uh, uh, links to our podcasts, which are on Anchor and Spotify. Uh, the it's at Post Concussion on Twitter. And also find us on Facebook. Uh, the Facebook groups include the main group. There is a group for ca caregivers and parents. There's a group for teenagers as well. And uh, a few other uh, groups on healing. And to recognise the 24th of June, as post-concussion post syndrome awareness day uh, so yeah check it out on facebook uh, just do the search or find the links in the, in the bio and so on uh, post-concussion and mild traumatic brain injury awareness worldwide on facebook so thank you again for listening um, I'm going to try and keep this podcast to round about the right length, uh, so it doesn't go on forever and ever. Um, back next time in episode three, uh, I'm starting to look into uh, a little bit about sports injuries as well um, and concussion in sport, although I don't want to make that too big of a subject because it's covered so much elsewhere. Um, it's covered, you know, kind of almost in every concussion blog and every page and everything as well, uh, particularly from North America where, where it's a, a, a hugely debated subject at the moment. Um, what I want to go forward to talk about as well is um, more, maybe some, some slightly technical details about the recovery process and how certain things can help the brain to heal quicker. And which certain things, as we've already mentioned a few today, can impede and slow down the healing of the brain 
uh, or, or even kind of cause a, a sort of stasis or a regression um, because we see so many people uh, or hear from so many people every day. Some are doing good things and they're, they're kind of very slowly, slowly making progress. Others are just kind of, you know, taking the four or five or six prescription drugs a day and, uh, and you know, and then, you know, they're, they're let down then when other things don't work because they've probably um, t not quite conscious enough or, or quite uh, there enough to, to be able to, to plan out a whole holistic plan for themselves. They're just hoping that the brain's just going to get better on its own, which I, I guess it will do in time, but you're probably looking at a lot, an awful lot longer. Uh, I know this from personal experience, like I said, of six, seven years of taking prescri prescription medications and after I stopped and, and got off them all, I was still the same, if probably worse than I was before. It nearly destroyed me, to be fair. Um, so yeah, you can remain kind of like in a, in, locked in a, like a, a time lock chamber while you're taking a lot of prescription medications. And although it can you know, help you to you get on with your life uh, and your journey in life, it, what it won't generally help you to get on with your journey in healing. So thanks again for listening, and uh, yeah, uh, send me any comments on uh, Anchor or on um, Twitter. Tweet me on Twitter or through Facebook, and uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.